individual psychology in war. So here we begin a series of lectures that are going to follow Kenneth Waltz's levels of analysis, where we're going to go from analyzing variables that occur at the individual psychological level of the leader, and we're going to progressively go to larger and larger groupings, to the committee, to the domestic regime type, and so forth. We've already looked at the systemic level when we looked at balance of power and hegemonic stability and war. So we're not going to go quite to the systemic level, but we're going to look at some uh, regional levels eventually. Well, this is a very complicated picture. What's happening here? Can we tell? What's the main activity in this image? We can ask ourselves, is human nature good or evil when it comes to the cause of war? Do humans cause war? Now, Kenneth Waltz asked the same question. And he asked a more specific question, which is, where do the causes of war lie? Where are they to be found? Is it in the nature of humanity? Is it in the structure of the separate states? Is it within the international system? There's a common tautology at the time that he was writing that bad states cause war and good states cause peace. Waltz's conclusion was that the international system is the most important cause of war because states behave the way they do, not because of their nature, but because they're shaped and shoved by the nature of the system, like a market. And so the states do what they have to in order to adapt and survive. So states that are protected on islands, like England, have the luxury of being a democracy. States in the center of Europe, like Germany, need very powerful militaries to protect themselves. So the hypothesis of many of the uh, early thinkers before him was that if you could universalize individual goodness, then you'd end up with peace. Now the pessimists thought, well, you know, we, we can't trust individuals, but maybe we can shape them through institutions. And the optimists thought, well, maybe we can change human nature by uh, having peace type education for them. Some believe that to create peace, you need to control the aggressive impulses of humans. Hobbes, Kant, Montesquieu, Rousseau, and Spinoza all made versions of this argument. So approaches to peace in the behavioral sciences has been to focus on understanding, social adjustment to reduce frustration and insecurity of the individual, the training of leaders, the expectations of men must be changed, to apply social sciences in the practice of government. The problem, of course, is that understanding can both promote peace as well as war. Now, Kenneth Waltz argues that human nature doesn't change, it's a constant. So it can't explain different periods when there's more war and less war. So for Kenneth Waltz, it's irrelevant. Human nature doesn't explain anything. So let's examine in more detail theories at the individual level. So individual level theories are stochastic in a sense. For example, we can't specify who specifically is going to win the lottery, but we can generally declare probabilistically a certain number of people are going to win. We can say that a certain number of people will be sick, we just can't identify specifically whom. So this is sort of one conception of the individual level where we're looking at the behavior of individuals and we see it as sort of uh, probabilistic. A second way to examine it is to look at decisions by leaders and the selection effect that brought the leaders there. How do leaders get into positions of leadership? Why were those people in particular able to navigate the system to the top? A key question is always how much of a selection effect is there? And you can often explore this counterfactually. Had uh, a leader been different, 
had Saddam Hussein not been the leader of Iraq or George Bush Sr. not been the president of the U.S., would decisions have been different? This is important because theories of assassination work on the assumption that some individuals are pivotal. So we could ask the question, for example, if Adolf Hitler had died prematurely, would Germany have behaved the same way? Would it have adopted a set of policies that would have led to war? This is the most requested picture from the U.S. government archives in the U.S. Richard Nixon. How important was he? Or were the policies of the U.S. at the time? Leaving Vietnam, the war on drugs, the detente with the Soviet Union, were these inevitable? So here we have a rogues gallery of important individuals in Germany in the lead up to the Second World War. So the counterfactual is if Adolf Hitler had died prematurely and one of these individuals had taken over, would things have been different? So let's take a look at some of these individuals. On the top left is Ernst Rahm, head of the SA, the bodyguard of the Nazi party. They basically engaged in street fights with communists. They were the working class conservatives, but they were also very socialist. And so they challenged the wealth hierarchy in Germany. They were the grassroots workers that supported the early NSDAP, the Nationalist Socialist Deutschland Albertung Party that would ultimately become the Nazi party. He had military experience as a mercenary fighting in South America, but ultimately he was seen as a threat because he was too far to the left as a populist and as a representative of the workers, and so he was assassinated. Then there's Erwin Rommel, the next individual to the left. He was a professional military soldier, not from a Prussian military class and not an active Nazi. He was very skilled. He ultimately, in the late war, joined with other traditional military leaders in rejecting the extreme policies of Nazism. He fought because he was a military man who wanted to protect his country, but he thought the goals of Germany were unrealistic. So he put his name in as a possible leader of the new government once Hitler was assassinated. And he was ultimately found out and then forced to commit suicide. If he had taken over, it's very likely Germany would have wanted to avoid a war. The third individual on the left was Rudolf Hess. He was an early Nazi. He helped smuggle chapters of Mein Kampf, Hitler's text, while it was being written, while Hitler was incarcerated in prison for leading the Beer Hall Putsch to try to take over the government of Bavaria and Munich. He had strong views on race, and he believed the English were of the same race as the Germans. So early in the Second World War, very disappointed with the fact that Germany and England were in conflict, he stole an airplane and flew to Scotland. And this was when he was the second highest ranked Nazi. He was going to replace Hitler. He landed in Scotland and was promptly arrested. And he eventually died in the 1990s in Spandau prison in uh, West Germany. The fourth person was Heinrich Himmler. He headed the Schutzstaffel, Hitler's bodyguard. These were the toughest core Nazis. It was this organization, which was completely dedicated to the Nazi cause, that ultimately defeated the SA headed by Ernst Rahm on the extreme left. The SS managed the concentration camps and the Einsatztruppen that conducted the genocide, the multiple genocides that Germany conducted. He was involved in the occult in order to create a culture for soldiers who fought for the Nazis, but he was very intelligent and very pragmatic. However, when he attended an execution in Prague, he fainted 
So this is not an individual who is individually, personally a violent man, but he pursued policies that were extreme. At the end of the war, he negotiated with the Americans in order to end the war. So he was rational and flexible. He probably would have been an incredibly aggressive and violent leader if he had replaced Hitler. Now going to the bottom left, we have Brauschitz. He was ahead of the German army. He was confident that he could control Hitler. But then Hitler made a move where he compelled the German army to give a personal oath to him as the Führer. And Brauschitz lost a lots, lost lot of power. If Brauschitz had recognized the totalitarian, totalitarian threat posed by Hitler, he could have moved earlier, but he didn't. And he allowed the German army to no longer be able to stand up to the Nazis. The next individual in the bottom center is Reinhard Heydrich. He was, by all accounts, very intelligent. He replaced Rudolf Hess as the second in command to Hitler. He was responsible, among other things, for running industrial development in Czechoslovakia, which was occupied by Germany. And Czechoslovakia had the Škoda Works and other industries that produced large arms quantities for the German military. Czechoslovakia was the most quiescent of the countries controlled by the Germans, and so the British ultimately sent a hit team of Czechs and assassinated him in Czechoslovakia. He was, by all accounts, very intelligent and very well, well organized as a Nazi party official. And if he had replaced Hitler, he probably would have been more effective. And the last individual on the bottom right is Admiral Canaris, a head of German military intelligence, Abwehr. He was anti-Nazi. And from very early on, because the German Navy was somewhat more liberal than the German Army or Air Force, he had engaged in secret discussions with the British through Spain for the purposes of ending the war. He was one of the key organizers of the July 22, 1944 attempted assassination of Adolf Hitler and ultimately he was captured and then executed by being hung by piano wire. Had he prevailed, it's very likely he would have brought the Second World War to a close and make peace with the Allies, at least the Western Allies. These, this is a list of individuals who are targeted at different times for assassinations. And it basically indicates that sometimes there's a theory that individuals are key and if they're assassinated, it will change the behavior of those that are following them. And sometimes this is true and sometimes it's not. The U.S made assassination illegal because of the illegal operations of the CIA, particularly to kill uh, Fidel Castro in Cuba. Uh, in 1974, the Church Committee recommended that it be illegal to do assassinations, and it was passed into law in the U.S. In 2001, the law was repealed, and the U.S. was again allowed legally to conduct assassinations. So we need to make a distinction between rational and non-rational decision models. So for a rational model, the starting point is abstract assumptions. We don't follow a rational model because it's necessarily real. It's a simplification. But we, we use them because they're useful. They seem to work. People that do not approximate rational behavior tend to be eliminated by the process of natural selection, particularly when you're looking for leaders. So all leaders should be approximately rational. The assumption is that people engage in goal-directed behavior. And so people have a consistent utility function of ranked ordered preferences, so that uh, preference A is better than preference C is better than preference C, and therefore preference A is better than preference C. And there should be no contradictions. So these are simplifying assumptions that are ideal for large end studies where we have no research access. access. And one of the big questions is a perception horizon. What's a rational perception horizon? 
Um, how concerned are we about the next ice age coming and landing on top of where we live? So, you know, it's a, it's a question and it's not immediately apparent what that time horizon should be. Now, a major methodological problem is establishing preferences of individuals by their behavior. But this assumes no strategic deception. Furthermore, it's been found in interviews that people have an incredible tendency to lie to themselves. There's a Seinfeld episode where George Costanza, who's an infamous liar in the comedy, is asked, how do you lie so well? And George Costanza's answer was, it's not a lie if you believe it. So expected utility, which was developed by Buena de Mesquita, is one technique that can be used to describe how decision makers are rational. Decision makers consider options in terms of the probabilistic outcomes associated with different choices, multiplied by the utilities associated with those outcomes. So for example, $100 times 50% is equivalent to $50 times 100%. That's a basic expected utility calculation. Buena de Mesquita extends this to war by coming up with the formula that says a payoff by attack times the probability of victory compared to the payoff of inaction times the probability of victory. And then leaders would then choose the highest expected utility between action and inaction to determine what they would do. Now Buena de Mesquita applied this to the case of wars between 1816 and 1974, and he found positive evidence that expected utility provides a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition for starting a war. So war is more likely to occur between unequals because of time availability and the greater availability of information for decision makers. The greater the amount of time, the more the decision maker has full information. So, you know, we could try to apply this model in 1990 when President Saddam Hussein uh, ordered his military to invade Kuwait because Saddam Hussein believed that the payoff of success times the probability of success was greater than the payoff of doing nothing and its probability of success. If Saddam Hussein did not in fact act, the weight of external debt would have weakened Iraq while Saddam Hussein believed there was a good chance that the US was not going to intervene and allow him to keep Kuwait. Uh, Iraq, if it had combined the oil of both Kuwait and Iraq, would have had enough oil reserves to challenge Saudi Arabia. Now there are also non-rational models. Now people are not dysfunctional, but people have difficulty dealing with large amounts of contradictory information. So in a sense, humans are categorizers. Right? And this is a part of schema theory. This is called non-motivational bias because it means it's not a bias caused by emotion, but a, but, a, but, a, but a bias caused by the limits of our cognition. So in schema theory, people categorize and label, but people are overwhelmed by sensation and information. And they're trying to obtain the relevant information by placing their experiences into different categories. Human cognitive abilities are limited, and therefore human rationality is bounded or abbreviated. These represent mental economies. Humans use shorthand diagnostics to understand situations. Recall that picture? Well, it's a morality play being conducted in the middle of a Dutch festival. But there's so much happening, it's difficult for us to point out what the overall theme is. So schemas have three benefits for humans. Schemas allow people to select what is important out of the flux of experience. Schemas are economical means of storing memories of objects and events. Schemas enable a person to go beyond the information given and make inferences about an object or a situation. Schemas enable a person to envision and carry out a sequence of actions to achieve a particular goal.
Now, associations between events will be remembered, especially if, first of all, they occurred firsthand, or they occurred early in life, or they had important consequences, or they're not linked with events that offer alternative explanations. So one of the consequences in terms of behavior is that humans tend to satisfy. They satisfy rather than optimize. To optimize is to spend a lot of resources looking for the best possible solution. Satisficing, however, is to choose the first best rather than the best possible course of action because humans don't have an unlimited amount of time. Humans can't optimize because of their cognitive limits. It undermines communication and increases misunderstandings of an adversary when we have this limitation. Now, for example, when you're looking for a mate to uh, reproduce with, you should probably date a thousand people. But most people don't. They satisfy. They basically go for the first good person they have a reaction with and then they commit to that person. Now this is a cognitive map of the Tai Gong Liu Tao that was developed by Johnston who examined the Chinese diplomatic schema. And what he wanted to do was determine are Chinese ideas about good Confucian governance or are they about power politics? And he found that in fact the Chinese use their schema of Confucian good governance to hide the fact, probably not even consciously, that they apply power politics solutions to diplomatic problems. Now, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in August of 1990, U.S. President George Bush made a very quick estimate of the situation. His schema was from his early experiences of war. He fought in the Second World War as a pilot, and then he subsequently served as a business person and then went on to serve as the head of the CIA and as the U.S. representative to the United Nations. And so with the experience of the Cold War, the early Cold War, and his experience in the Second World War fighting the Japanese, this led him to believe, believe that Saddam Hussein was like one of those fascist leaders from the Second World War. And it led him to pursue policies that led to a military rather than economic solution. Now, cognitive dissonance theory is a motivational bias. A motivational bias means it produces an emotional response or an emotional uh, consequence that people react against. So inconsistencies within the cognitive system cause an uncomfortable state of tension that people are then motivated to reduce or eliminate. The underlying assumption is that people's beliefs are highly interconnected and should be mutually coherent. The existence of dissonant elements create a negative drive that will motivate the person emotionally to reduce or eliminate the inconsistency. For example, all of us have a self-image that we're nice. But when we act in a moody fashion and we hurt others, and then we see this somehow in a videotape or a recording, it's painful because we can't reconcile the fact that we're behaving badly, but we think of ourselves as nice. So there's three ways to reduce dissonance. Number one, you can change the behavior associated with one of the dissonant cognitive elements. You could act nicely. Two, you can alter the physical or psychological environment. You could, for example, avoid people. And three, you can add consistent cognitive elements to change the ratio to dissonant cognitions inside your head. So you could perhaps blame other people for being evil. And so you're not the one acting poorly, they're the ones who deserve your, your treatment. So you treat them badly because they're bad people. Now people vary in their reaction to cognitive dissonance in three ways. People have, number one, differing thresholds of tolerance for inconsistency. Two, inconsistency is relative to different cognitive maps. 
And three, people differ in their preferred methods of reducing consistency or inconsistency. So people have various levels of uptightness in response to these contradictions. Now fear and anxiety amplify these stresses and may produce defensive mechanisms. And these most likely emerge when people are involved in high intensity choices, such as choices that require the trade-off between two or more sets of high value goals that cannot be satisfied simultaneously. For example, having to choose between which of our children will live. These are outcomes that are or situations that are typical of crises where a decision maker has to make some very important choices very quickly. A very cognitive dissonance is sending young men and women to war. You don't want to send young men and women to war because they're going to suffer and die, some of them. So it's a very painful decision. But to make it consistent, American presidents have always couched sending soldiers to war with the argument that by sending the soldiers to war now, we're going to avoid a much bigger war later, and so we're ultimately going to save lives. So letting people die now or be killed now is going to save more lives later on. And that logic makes the action consistent. Now, a principal distortion is defensive avoidance of the situation. If there's too much cognitive dissonance amplified by anxiety, people are just going to not want to think about the problem. Now, the consequence is that people seek a stable set of beliefs. And this is often unnatural or incorrect or doesn't fit the actual situation. So this can lead to systematic errors and biases in the interpretation of information. It undermines communications and increases misunderstandings of an adversary. So during the Vietnam War in the late 1960s, the prospect that the war was un unwinnable was in the mind of some people. But at the same time, the U.S. could not pull out because of the damage it would do uh, to the confidence that U.S. allies had in U.S. deterrence. So the U.S., led by President Johnson, decided to stay in the war. So this is a form of defensive avoidance. Johnson basically avoided the issue and just kept the policy going. Here you can see uh, Lyndon Johnson, U.S. President, negotiating with Ngo Dinh Diem. And here you can see U.S. Marines uh, in the middle of close combat. So one individual human instinctual behavior that has received a significant amount of evidence is the effects of in-groupism and out-groupism. Humans are social animals that thrive in groups and we strive to belong to a group. In-groupism states that people's self-worth is enhanced by their identification with the purpose of a group. Now, out-groupism is the tendency to view groups outside of one's own as illegitimate and to exaggerate the hostility of them as a threat to the in-group. So this is one of those instances where human nature has the individual affecting how they interact with a group which then goes and affects their individual decision-making. In-groupism and out-groupism is inversely related. The more tight the in-group, the more suspicious, fearful, or hostile they are to the out-group. As well, the more suspicious, provocative, or hostile is the behavior of the out-group, the more tight is the in-group. These relationships are therefore mutually reinforcing. The implication for constructing identities is that no in-group can survive without an out-group. And we can think of this uh, with regard to sports teams, if we played sports or we've been in a group, that we always see the other group as sort of odd, and our group is just naturally correct. So how do we define ourselves as Canadians in light of in-groupism and out-groupism? Uh, very often it's uh, in contrast to other identity competitions. So it would be in contrast most likely to the United States. So we define ourselves as different from the United States in large part because uh, we are in fact very similar in terms of language and accent and aspects of our culture. 
So even those who profess to be rebels are defining their identities in contrast to what they see as an outgroup. Extrapolating this to interstate relations, we can dovetail in-groupism, outgroupism with the security dilemma in, when, when, in which one exaggerates the extent to which outgroups are preparing hostilities against the in-groups. And this produces a fundamental attribution error in which outgroups are attributed with hostile policies by choice and in-groups are attributed with defensive policies by necessity. So the fundamental attribution error is a bias. We always assume that outgroups engage in activities and they can choose not to engage in those activities if they, if they simply made that choice, where in-groups are compelled by circumstances to do things. So when the outgroup attacks us, it's because they're evil and they planned malicious plans and when we attack someone, it's because we're doing it defensively. This seems adaptive. It predisposes early humans to be suspicious of nature and its many dangers, wild cats, bears, and perhaps other hostile simians. But it makes interstate negotiation very difficult between decision makers. An important decision-making consequence of in-groupism and out-groupism is groupthink. This was identified by Irving Janus. Group think is a mode of thinking that people engage in when they're deeply involved in a cohesive in-group. When the members are striving for unanimity, overrides their motivation to realistically appraise alternative courses of action. The more amiability and esprit de corps among members of a policymaking in-group, the greater is the danger that independent critical thinking will be replaced by groupthink which is likely to result in irrational and dehumanizing actions directed against the outgroup. The eight symptoms of groupthink are illusion of invulnerability, belief in the inherent morality of the group, collective rationalization, outgroup stereotypes, self-censorship, I'm basically not going to rock the boat, illusions of unanimity, direct pressure on dissenters, and self-appointed mind guards who make sure that there are no dissenters. Groupthink can result from conformist voting in which respondents in a group are influenced by prior respondents. So this is the game. Respondents have a two-third chance of getting good information and of course a one-third chance of getting bad information. And six get good information and three get bad information. And players conform when aggregate preceding evidence outweighs their information and they are randomly consulted. There's a high probability in this game theoretic formula formulation of placing a premium on conformity rather than a voracious presentation of information. So this is sort of a game theoretic representation of how uh, people are going to conform rather than present accurate information. Uh, there's a reference in your notes and you can get more information on the source of this model. In-groupism was evident in the example of the 1967 war. Nasser decided to deploy his army to the Sinai Desert in response to an Israeli raid in the Gaza. Nasser towered over most of the other Egyptian political leaders and advisors, particularly those in the military, because he had military experience fighting Israel in its war of independence. And there was therefore very little critical thought or resistance to his proposal. His move was, however, to provoke the Israelis into a violent counterstrike that resulted in the Six Days War of 1967 and the defeat of Egypt's army. Uh, Mohammed Fauzi was the chief of staff and he's the individual in the bottom picture. A solution is the devil's advocate, an individual in the group who's assigned with questioning every idea and every assertion in order to guard against the negative informational consequences of groupthink. An important application of in-groupism and out-groupism is the idea that it explains mass killing and genocide that essentially fosters hate, dehumanization, and demonization of outgroups, other people, and that there are political circumstances where these escalate and lead to large-scale death, very often in war and very often outside war.
One of the seminal treatments of this is Omer Bartov in his book, Hitler's Army, 1991. And he wanted to answer a very specific case, which is what caused the German army to be so brutal during its invasion of the Soviet Union in World War II. Uh, Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union on June 22nd, 1941, and it was eventually defeated in 1945. During the conflict, between 20 and 27 million Soviet citizens were killed on the battlefield, uh, or murdered, or taken to concentration camps, or starved. And so we have a puzzle here because the German army was not so brutal in its fight in the West against the French, against the English, against the Americans. So the conventional wisdom in the historiography, uh, particularly in the uh, Holocaust literature, is that uh, within Nazi Germany, you had a very small group of secretive Nazis who had an agenda to create essentially a reproduction of North America, where Germans wanting land, Leibensraum, would conquer Eastern Europe, Poland and the Soviet Union and Ukraine, and would then depopulate the region and free up fertile land for German migration of farmers. So this is the uh, conventional wisdom. Now, Omar Bartov rejects this. His conjecture is that the mass killing conducted in the Soviet Union was done by normal Germans. And to some extent, this is supported by other evidence. Hannah Arendt, a philosopher, attended the trial of Adolf Eichmann, who was a senior Nazi responsible for the genocide of the Jews at Auschwitz. He was kidnapped in Argentina, brought to Israel for trial. And Hannah Arendt's conclusion from the trial was that Adolf Eichmann was otherwise an upstanding individual. He was a family man, intelligent, educated, moderate. And so the question became, how do normal, well-adjusted people engage in such extreme levels of violence? So Omar Bartov proposes to explain it with four hypotheses. The first is the pervasive propaganda of children growing up within Nazi Germany, particularly after the consolidation of power under Adolf Hitler in 1933 and 1934. And you have the demon, de demonization the, uh, and the dehumanization of communities targeted as undesirable uh, in propaganda uh, at school and in the Hitler Youth, the Hitler Jugend. And so uh, Jews, communists, uh, people of the East like Poles and Russians were depicted as dehumanized. This propaganda was then carried through during the war. And this is evident in, in the letters of the German soldiers when they're writing home. So a lot of the message, messages that came uh, through the earlier stage of youth uh, was also present. Now this is important because uh, there's a major alternative explanation, which is that the German soldiers in the Second World War didn't fight for Nazism, didn't fight for Hitler, uh, didn't particularly uh, want the Jews to be killed, uh, they were fighting for their small unit cohesion, small groups of 10 soldiers, and essentially it was the love of the small group that kept the war going. And Omar Bartov challenges this. He challenges the survey evidence done on German soldiers at the end of the war and said that basically they were hiding this evidence. And one of his uh, sources of evidence is that the Germans had largely lost cohesion in the East in the fight against the Soviet Union because of the incredible losses and turnover of soldiers, cohesion never had enough time to set in. So German soldiers that said they were fighting for their buddies uh, were actually um, not responding in good faith. The third hypothesis is that the extreme level of discipline within the German army left, led to a, a uh, sort of letting off steam kind of function where German soldiers would would then brutally treat Soviet citizens and very often conducted unauthorized killings even against German military law uh, in the areas where they lived. The fourth hypothesis is that once the Germans had inflicted such brutality on Soviet citizens and the Germans stalemated and started to lose the war, 
they had a great fear of re revenge uh, by the Soviets. And on the one hand, this made the Germans fight better, but it also perpetuated more violence against uh, Soviet citizens. Why do people commit mass killing? Now, Benjamin Valentino, in his book, Final Solutions, challenges the conventional wisdom. The conventional wisdom is that mass killing, including genocide, is caused by hate. When one group, stoked by the propaganda of a country, dislike another group, then very often it results in mass killing. In the genocide literature, anti-Semitism, which is a form of Christian religious interpretation of the place of the Jews within Christendom, uh, uh, evolved uh, through nationalism in the 19th century, where you had in-groupism and out-groupism based on language and identity, to then foster uh, the particular dislike of the Jews uh, in the German population. And that this then explains why the Holocaust was conducted against the Jews. Now, Benjamin Valentino challenges this conventional wisdom, particularly the claims of mainstream genocide scholars. He finds that hate is very common. It's pervasive, in fact. But the genocide is very rare. Therefore, hate cannot possibly be the cause because uh, it's almost a constant. Although it varies for certain levels, the puzzle is where you see genocide happening, the level of hate is not that high. The Germans had propaganda against Jews, but the level of hatred between the Germans and Jews was far less than in other communities in the world. And so there were other factors at play. There were agents or small groups that created the circumstances for the genocide. And in order to do so, uh, they did this by capturing the state, augmenting the propaganda, and in most cases, circumventing the general public opinion against genocide. So Benjamin Valentino is challenging Omar Bartov that the Holocaust and instances of mass killing were the product of normal people. And it was not conducted uh, by the general population. It was basically manipulated uh, deceptively by a small group. So this is his first hypothesis. Uh, which is that mass killing is caused by small groups that manipulate majorities. And he applies this to three instances. The first instance of mass killing are communist social transformations. So you have governments which are attempting to revolutionarily change the way society is structured. This very often involves uh, eliminating certain classes of wealthy landowners. It also involves dispossessing rural populations of their uh, hereditary land and radically changing how urban populations are organized. And these populations very often resist. Now the genocide is not the direct consequence of the communization. The communist governments don't want to kill people, but in the process of the resistance, very often famine is the result, and therein you get mass death. His case studies are communism in the Soviet Union, communism in China, and communism in Cambodia, all of which produced millions or tens of millions of death, uh, very often through starvation. A second instance of mass killing is genocides after attempts at exile fail. So in this instance, you have a population which does not like uh, another population, and their first inclination is to ex exclude them from power and to have them deported. Now the problem with deportation is if you deport them, if you displace the population just on the other side of the border, then the population may want to return. Or it may join a hostile force outside the country. So if exile or expulsion uh, is a plan, 
then the individuals that are being expelled, uh, the intention is for them to go very, very far. So in the cases that Benjamin Valentino looks at, there's the case of the Armenians. Uh, the uh, Ottoman Empire was fearful of being dismembered and um, they were fearful that the Armenians would be manipulated by the Russians, the English and the French to facilitate that uh, imperial disintegration. And many Armenians who had fled the Ottoman Empire had signed up with the Russian army. So the decision was made to uh, lead them into the desert of northern Mesopotamia and have them uh, starve en masse. In the case of the Holocaust of the Jews, uh, initially the goal was expulsion from Germany, and this was uh, broadly achieved. Uh, overwhelming proportion of the population fled as best they could, given the limits of Western countries' immigration policies. Countries like England, the US, and Canada uh, resisted Jewish immigration for quite some time. But when World War II started with the German invasion of Poland, expulsion was no longer possible and the policy uh, shifted gradually uh, towards isolation of the community and then ultimately um, uh, in 1941-42 the decision was made uh, to conduct the genocide and um, a large portion of the Jewish community as well as the Roma community uh, were killed by 1943. So, uh, within, within wars, you have an association of genocide, uh, in part because once the war is happening, exile is not a possibility. There's also the application of the theory to the case of Rwanda, which showed how a small group uh, uh, essentially captured the state and then conducted the genocide by amplifying the propaganda. The third application is mass killing occurs during attempts to defeat insurgencies and here Valentino applies it to the case of the Guatemalan government against the uh, rural insurgents many of whom were associated with uh, communists and uh, it, it, there's a, a, a demonstration that while it wasn't entirely based on the difference between the Guatemalan population and the largely indigenous rural Guatemalan population because there were cases of the government targeting non-indigenous people. Uh, it resulted in over a hundred thousand deaths and the movement of refugees into Mexico and in fact Mexico accommodating Guatemala by relocating the uh, refugee camps some distance from the common border. And the final case is the amplification of the Soviet counterinsurgency operation in Afghanistan, which initially uh, was fairly restrained, but then went for the wholesale destruction of villages that created millions of refugees that fled into Pakistan and Iran. Why do people commit mass killing? Alexander Downs, in his 2012 book, Targeting Civilians in War, attempted to refine the arguments of Valentino. And he added case studies that further specified uh, the case of when civilians are targeted. These don't always result in mass killing, but they have the potential for mass killing. And uh, in this instance, mass killing is interpreted as a, uh, the extreme outcome of the act of targeting uh, non-combatants. Sometimes uh, a small number of non-combatants are killed, other times a very large number of non-combatants are killed. And it's, it's not always uh, done as a part of a, a genocide plan. Uh, there are instances in normal war where this occurs. So there are three hypotheses that Downs proposes. And the first is that states use mass killing as a desperate last resort in war. In other words, states don't start off with a plan to kill civilians. It's more efficient to take military force to defeat other military force and then have your enemy exposed to direct attack by a military. But uh, very often militaries are not able to win on the battlefield. You end up with stalemates or expensive quagmires and then the leadership starts to become desperate and then targets civilians. 
So the cases that Downs looks at are the British blockade of Germany, which resulted in a significant amount of starvation and famine, which had a serious impact on how Germany was organized for World War II. The second case was German submarine warfare against England and the attempt to starve out the English, again by starving them, of the uh, food imports. The third case was the Second Boer War, where the British rounded up a very large portion of the Boer resistance in South Africa and put them in camps. And a large double-digit percentage of the women and children non-combatants died of starvation and disease in those camps. The second hypothesis is that states use mass killings to displace indigenous people. When there is a colonial population that comes in and they want uh, to exploit a natural resource, they will depend on the local population to provide labor in order to exploit those resources, such as mines. But when colonial populations are seeking agricultural land, they will very often displace the indigenous people and uh, in some instances kill them if they're not able to relocate that population. The case that Downs looks at is the 1948 creation of the State of Israel and the displacement of the Palestinians. Now the scale of uh, indigenous people killed in this instance is not great, but it's the variable um, that is of interest. And of course the value of the number of civilians killed in the process uh, depends on other factors. But this hypothesis applies to uh, colonial efforts in North, South and Central America as well as Australia and New Zealand. The third hypothesis is that democracies are more likely to do mass killing. And it's essentially because democracies are uh, island powers like England and the US. They're well protected, so they tend to be displaced from continental politics. Therefore, they have large fleets and they're more likely to have bombers, heavy bombers that would uh, strategically hit enemy cities. Continental powers like the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany and uh, Imperial Japan did not because they were committed to fighting on the continent and their focus is on uh, using uh, aircraft to attack other military forces. So this is a surprising uh, conclusion that Downs comes up with and is convincing. And his two cases are the US bombing of Japan during the Second World War and the German bombing of England during the Blitz. Specifically, the uh, policy of targeting civilians as a way of undermining the popular resolve to continue the war by the country. Now, some individuals look at developmental dispositions, how youthful upbringing can affect personality later in life. And Friedlander and Cohen did this. They tried to explain aggression in decision-making in international relations. Their study was apparently based on clinical evidence of personality types and behavior. And they had one interesting case of British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. The dependent variable they wanted to explain was aggressive preferences rather than decision. So they looked at three tendencies. One, a rebellious attitude towards authority, and this often implied a jealousy of power. Two, a dominating authority over others. And three, bluster, which is, in this case, verbal aggression rather than avoidance. So they noticed four characteristics in individuals who tended to engage in aggressive decisions once they were in leadership positions. One, shyness. Two, intolerance. Three, a belief in social Darwinism, and four, paranoia. So belligerence can be traced back to early life and described as having their source in four independent variables. First of all, the family environment. Whenever the family environment had a very strong female presence, uh, it led to either passivity or over-masculinity or compensation. Two, the child's relationship with the parents. Often, if the upbringing was authoritarian, it led to a reaction to outgroups. The third was the child's welfare, whether they were unhappy growing up or they suffered from ill health. And the fourth was their education. Did they receive a social Darwinian, uh, all in a fight against all type of education and therefore perspective about real life?
Now, the consequence is that sometimes belligerence is rational, but these are infrequent for Friedlander and Cohen. Suppressing internal information exchange with colleagues in government is never efficient, and so any aggression within the group limits the ability of that individual to operate within small decision-making groups. But there are problems with their study. The first is that warlike personalities can be productive domestically in activities like business or education or sports. Also, Friedlander and Cohen select on the dependent variable. They chose consistently belligerent individuals. We need to also choose peaceful individuals to see if their family backgrounds were substantially different. And three, can we infer much from this study because of the focus on Western personalities? If there's a distinction between guilt or individual versus group shame cultures, uh, there might be a very different result. And finally, uh, from my personal knowledge of having researched the lives of some of the political leaders, particularly uh, Winston Churchill, uh, I think they actually completely mischaracterize his actual personality.